everybody. I have to tell the Zoom lady that it's okay to accept the recording. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning for this, the second of our webinars um, that's talking about the Agile curriculum. Um, I am delighted to uh, that our chair for um, today is Dr. Jim Murray from uh, THEA, a board member of the National Forum. And uh, Jim uh, chaired our first session. So I'm delighted now to hand over to Jim for this session. There you go, Jim. Thanks very much, Terry. Um, we're all very welcome. And uh, just to reiterate, Terry's welcome on behalf of the, the board of the, the National Forum. Uh, this is a very, very interesting and topical uh, topic, as we discovered at the last meeting, the, the, the first webinar on this topic. Uh, and what we want to try to do today is, is to uh, take stock of where we were to, uh, out of coming out of the first webinar uh, and develop it a bit further and uh, move along ultimately to uh, hopefully getting into a space where we can define what an, an Agile cu curriculum is ultimately. Uh, we have a bit of work to do still though, so we, 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 we'll, we move ahead. Uh, you can just see the agenda, or just very brief bit of scene setting and context. Then we're going to have uh, lightning talks uh, from, as, as it turns out, unfortunately, one of our speakers say, but we'll have three project leads from the uh, HCI Pillar 3 projects. We'll have a perspective from employers through ISME, and then we'll have a panel discussion at the end. And there will be a, a, a further exercise looking back as, as, as well and what we've, what we've learned from the uh, discussions to date. Uh, so we might just, in, in terms of housekeeping, um, you will have heard, I think, the, the, the lady from Zoom telling us that the webinar has been recorded. So just to, to, to highlight that to you. Um, and that's really to help with the uh, preparation of the publication um, so that we're not all scribbling a hundred million notes uh, throughout this. Um, we very much welcome comments and questions uh, through the chat uh, in, 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 in this webinar that they would be really helpful and, and certainly will help also inform our panel discussion today. Uh, and also just to, to extend the thanks to everyone who on registration did actually respond to the, to, to the prompt questions. So again, if we might just move on to the next slide, just to, to, to recall a little bit from the first webinar, um, you know, the, the key question we were trying to answer there is why is it important to develop an understanding of what we mean by an agile, an agile curriculum at this time? Uh, the concept is, 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 is really becoming more and more prominent. Um, I mean, the HCI Pillar 3 Innovation and Agility uh, initiative that that really you know has, has has highlighted the concept of agility and brought it very much into the lives of quite a lot of uh, academic colleagues now as, as uh, those who are working on on, on the HCI projects um, and those those projects are very very big projects and they're very extensive and they've quite a lot of tentacles so this is a a, a concept that uh, you know is really really uh, coming to the fore now in the community um, there's 22 of those and it says that they're very, very big projects. So uh, the reach of them is, 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 is very extensive. And at the first webinar, we really began to see the really very exciting and, and, and very challenging work that's starting to happen in these projects. And, and through that, uh, we're, we're building this concept of an agile curriculum and hopefully today too, uh, we, we will see that emerging, emergence actually uh, quickening and accelerating. Uh, so maybe we might just uh, move on to the next slide. Thanks very much. Um, so today's webinar, as I said, it's to continue this conversation uh, around the Agile uh, curriculum. And we want to explore further the features that were identified and associated with the Agile curriculum. And um, we. You know, today we will we will get more insights from our uh, additional projects that, that that are under the HCI banner. That uh, and uh, we'll also have this employer perspective as well, which I think is very important uh, that we're not just talking to ourselves. So I'm going to stop talking now and introduce the uh, 
the main people, uh, the, our, our, our speakers. Uh, so we have uh, three projects. Uh, just to uh, acknowledge the uh, apologies of, of Dr. Marguerite Nyan from UCC, who's going to speak to us on sustainable futures, but she's had a, uh, a, a, a router uh, IT uh, breakdown, which is uh, very unfortunate. Uh, so, so hopefully we'll be able to hear from Marguerite in some uh, context again. But we do have uh, our first speaker is Professor Jacqueline McCormick from IT Sligo, and she's going to talk about the HCI Pillar 3 project, Higher Education 4.0. We have Dr. Blonde White from DCU, and she will talk about DCU Futures. And we have Dr. Ken Thomas uh, from Engineering and WIT, who's going to talk about the AMAS or AMASE project, and I'll, I'll let Ken, uh, he can explain that to us further. So uh, I'd like to call on Jacqueline first, who, who will uh, tell us about the Higher Education 4.0 project. Thank you. Okay, hopefully, can you hear me okay? Yeah, and can you see my screen all right? Yeah, okay. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present on the Higher Education 4.0 project. Um, so Higher Education 4.0 is a, an ambitious and innovative project from the members of the Connacht Ulster Alliance. So ourselves and IT Sligo plus GMIT and LYIT. And uh, then we also have um, uh, a large number of enterprise partners who are involved in various different aspects of the project. So although the three uh, partners uh, within the Connacht Ulster Alliance uh, you know, have a significant ex experience to date in lifelong learning and online learning, this project really represents a step change for us in terms of our activities, um, you know, allowing us to have higher levels of innovation, uh, improving um, access and quality, increasing flexible and agil flexibility and agility, and hopefully reducing the cost of provision of higher education by introducing a number of new models of learning. So our project consists of a set of interlinked online learning innovations, which are underpinned then by a series of um, 21 sub uh, demonstration or innovation sub projects. And the aims of it really are about trying to build uh, lean systems necessary to respond rapidly and effectively to training and uh, higher education needs of employers and employees to allow us uh, to cost effectively develop um, new flexible modes of higher education for both younger and lifelong learners. So um, overall, the project contains uh, a number of key innovative actions, and um, this is allowing us to responsibly um, develop um, convenient and flexible courses uh, you know to meet the needs of, of employers and employees through systematically monitoring their requirements coupled along with systems for uh, lean uh, course development processes. We also hope to assist adults in the recognition of prior learning or RPL and through developing a career uh, uh, lear learning and learning pathways through higher education. We also uh, plan to improve the quality of the learning experiences of both our on-campus learners and our lifelong learners by developing a range of different new models of um, online and flexible learning enhanced by um, various aspects of technology. And as well as this, we hope to achieve for these processes financial sustainability by minimizing our development costs using uh, lean content methodologies and trying to achieve economies of scale. So within the project, um, there are two services that we plan to develop. The first of these is an externally facing service, a learning pathway service. And, um, you know, it, it um, plans to, um, to provide RPL and careers and study advisory services, which are focused on accessibility and future proofing learners with relevant um, uh, industry relevant skills. We plan to inform this process by regular engagement with employers. We plan to advise um, these individuals who would be making use of this, uh, of this service in terms of learning pathways that would be available to them to help them to try and achieve their career objectives or improve their employability. So we'll be guiding them through this process. We'll also help them to try and gain credit for both their formal and experiential learning that they've already um, achieved um, through their career path to date. 
um, to try and help them in, uh, in, in terms of their career development and then assist them in aggregating their learning towards major awards and using the information that we gather through employers to help us to rapidly um, uh, drive our new program development processes. In terms of the second uh, service that we're planning to implement, this is an internally facing service, uh, a lean content development unit. So it's really about trying to um, have more agile processes for program and content creation, um, helping us to build a system which will allow us to respond as quickly and, and as an agile way as possible to meet the needs of employees and uh, employers in, a, in an agile and, and efficient, efficient and cost effective way. And the service then will include both the technology that's required, the personnel, and then as well as that, the implementation of a, a lean course content creation methodology process. Um, so I don't have time in this like five minute presentation to go through the details of the project. So I'll just kind of quickly put it up. There are three themes in it. The first is the, the one to do with the learning pathways into and through higher education, the aspects to do with RPL and the career pathway service. The second theme then is to do with the innovation aspects about helping us to facilitate these opportunities at scale to meet the needs of employers and employees. So there is the support service and then we have um, 21 kind of sub projects that are aligned underneath this one big project where our, our academic colleagues across the three CUA colleges have put forward a whole uh, suite of different um, innovative modes of, of um, flexible and online learning um, as, as um, sub projects within this bigger project. And then because there are so many kind of moving parts within it, the third theme then is about the enablement of the project in terms of the coordination of the various different sub projects and aspects involved. We uh, recognize that in um, these processes to develop uh, agile curriculum are going to require us to develop policies and processes and regulations within the three institutions. Uh, so a part of this project will also be de dedicated to developing evidence based recommendations for policy regulation and process changes and then implementing them across the three partner institutions, although hopefully within the next short while we'll become one institution. And um, so implementing them then across the technological university. So obviously it's a very quick presentation, haven't got time to go into the details in five minutes, but you know, this project maps out our vision for the future ability of higher education so that we are um, able to respond in an agile way to the needs of individuals and to employers. And we'll be using the funding then to establish the capacity to allow us to be able to implement this vision and establish it in a sustainable way. And if anyone has any questions, they can contact me by email. Okay, hopefully I'll just stop sharing now. Thank you, Jim. Thanks very much, Jackie. Um, so uh, very interesting presentation there. And, and, and uh, I, I was quite taken by the fact that the, the agile uh, curriculum also depends on agile processes and, 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 and uh, appropriate policies. So that, that's, that'll be a challenge for institutions as, as we're developing agile curricula to, to respond in, in, in an appropriate manner. Okay, uh, I'd like to call on Blonet now to, to uh, talk about the DCU Futures Project. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen here um, and hope everybody can see that. And so, great, thank you. I'm going to quickly, like Jacqueline, give you a whirlwind tour through DCU Futures, which is our major HCI program. Um, and I put my name up here. Um, I'm the Dean of Strategic Learning Innovation in DCU, but also that of my colleague, Kieran Dunn, who's the Transversal Skills Director. Um, they're both posts that were created um, explicitly as part of the Futures Programme. And so if you've got any questions from today, please feel free to contact either of us. And one of the things I was anxious to do today, um, cognizant of building, like Jim said, from the last one was to consider what did we mean in terms of agility? And for us in DCU, essentially what we're trying to, to achieve is an agile curriculum which creates agile graduates who can thrive in a world that's changing regardless of how it's changing and actually can shape how those changes are going forward. And um, I, I, it's great that I follow immediately from Jacqueline because the other consideration for us and 
I was struck by what Lynn spoke, Lynn Ramsey spoke about in the last one too, around how you, you foreground all this. And the project that I'll talk about in a couple of seconds is around our hopes and our aims to achieve that. But we need an awful lot in place in order to, to be able to be agile. And so when we thought around this, this future, the, this slide here is around the, the different components, the strands that we need to, to enable our um, th that agility. And for us, uh, that looks like that we have that, that ongoing continual conversation um, with industry around what the skills needs are so that we can be responsive to them, um, but we're, they're, they're accurately informed and that we're building a flexibility into our approval processes um, to allow us to be able to adapt in this way. Critically for us too, it, it, there's a large piece around in increasing our staff capacity to embed particularly things like challenge-based learning and our innovations in our teaching and calling out explicitly that institutionally this curriculum renewal is at the heart of our strategy. And so my post, for example, um, it's the first new deanship DCU has created in over 20 years and it speaks very strongly institutionally to just how important it is and curriculum renewal and DCU future sit within the first pillar of our um, institutional strategy, as well as increasing our staff capacity from an academic perspective, but also increasing the support. So dedicated learning designers and learning technologists so that we can apply that scholarship and teaching and learning to ensure we've got robust pedagogies around what we're incorporating and building in that systematic flexibility in our program so that there is that things aren't locked in place for the next four years. And then the last component for us is around explicitly designing in robust transversal skills development across all our programs, regardless of what they are. And all those strands for us give us DCU futures. And so DCU futures is the reimagination, that radical reimagination of our curriculum. Um, and we're building it on, on three components. So the looking to the future in terms of what our students will need to learn, transforming how they're going to learn, and then embedding the transversal skills our students will need to thrive in, in the future. So in terms of new areas of study, we considered very strongly as the world is changing, what does it look like? And we're considering how, how data and technology infuse our world. We're transitioning to the zero carbon economy. That, Institutionally, as a higher um, higher education institution, we have a responsibility towards helping to support, in the most holistic sense, a sustainable society going forward. And also that our graduates, they continue to be employable, but with human-centric discipline skills. And so considering all of those, these are the 10 new programs and specialisms that we're developing within Futures. And all but the BSc and Global Challenges, we have... Um, worked flat out since we got the funding. So they're all ready for a September 2021 intake. And you'll see they're all, if I take, for example, chemistry, which is my background, we look at what we're doing in terms of say COVID vaccine development and, and leveraging machine learning to, to enhance drug development and then drug production systems, things like that. So here we see that, the, the, like I say, that evolution in what our students learn. But wrapped up in that too is also transforming how they learn. So those innovations, both in pedagogy and in assessment with things like that online learning to teach students how to learn online so that they can become lifelong learners. Um, looking at things like virtual labs, you heard last week from Denise Rooney around um, DC or a partner also in that project, challenge-based learning very strongly with students working on real world problems and that ongoing deep engagement with industry. And the idea is that this all becomes part of the DNA of the programs, what we're doing. And we do an awful lot of it already in DCU, but not at a systematic program level that's infused at, by, by design from the very beginning. And then the third strand is around the transversal skills pathway, whereby recognizing that our graduates will have an increased career mobility. And that, so that value of that interdisciplinarity, but still having graduates who are eminently employable and who can work across multiple domains um, and so that brings the third component this transversal skills component which we've built on those four pillars ways of thinking ways of working tools for working and tools for thriving so that our students can really in the most holistic sense um, really achieve the fullness of who they want to be when they graduate from us and that is my whistle stop tour through DCU futures which I've hopefully kept the time for thank you very much Thank you very much, Blanet. Uh, very, very interesting. Again, very taken by your, um, your your statement around 
you know, the, 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 the human centric and the learner centric aspect of this, um, you know, I, 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 you know, preparing students to thrive in an unscripted world and differentiating them from AI and automation, those, those, those concepts I think are very important as part of the, the agile curriculum. Um, so we, we can see the, you know, the dimensions where institutions, staff, students, all and 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 uh, the, the out the whole world really has to contribute to to development of this agile curriculum so very exciting and it's bringing in so many different dimensions uh so our our, our final whistle stop tour is uh going to come from dr ken thomas from wit uh who's going to talk about the amos project ken Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Jim and, and Terry and everybody involved here today. Um, delighted to be to be here. Um, I was told this to be a lightning talk. I decided to go for one slide. I thought that might be appropriate and uh, to try and talk around this one slide, if that's okay for everybody. Uh, our, our topic, unlike Jacqueline and, and, and Blana there, is very focused on one particular, our, our, our HEI pillar project, is just a pillar three project, is very focused on one topic called additive manufacturing which is 3D printing in most people's language, but additive manufacturing is the official title. And the AMAZE project that Jim referred to earlier, AMASE, is additive manufacturing advancing the Southeast. So it's getting a very much a regional uh, approach and a bit like Jacqueline mentioned earlier on about the, the CUA, the Connacht Ulster Alliance. We very much developed this proposal and it eventually became successful in partnership with stakeholders in the region. It, it ticked the boxes in terms of ourselves and, and colleagues in Carlo and our TU project uh, and, and plans. So it brought together a lot of moving plates, if you like, within the region and very much focused on the strategic development of additive manufacturing skills and knowledge in the region. So we want to make the southeast of Ireland at the cutting edge of 3D printing manufacturing. Uh, and we have a possibility to do so because we've got some very leading edge companies. So we developed this particular application and indeed program with, with our companies, 10, 10 leading companies in the region. So that co-creation idea and working and being agile to work with our, with our partners in industry. Uh, we also work with Engineering the Southeast Cluster. And again, the academics within the organization, even the agileness of using our research informed teaching and our research facilities came into the picture here as well. So we had a lot of in-house resources that we're able to call upon and a lot of connections with our external stakeholders in the region that we called upon and brought that together uh, under this project. And even though we're, we're, we're trying to push the whole region, we, 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 it's the HCI Pillar Project, or Pillar 3 Project, is focused on a new degree in additive manufacturing at level seven, but it's got four in embedded awards as well. So we got across the micro credential idea. So not necessarily everybody wants to do it, do the full program, I just to want to do part of the program. So there's an agile aspect to that as well. Uh, it's also gonna be a mix of online, work integrated, work-based and campus-based. So there's a lot of agility involved in all of that um, delivery uh, aspect of our program. Uh, and again, it's gonna be targeted at full-time working people. So you're gonna try and figure out how do you, how are you agile enough to cope with people who are working full-time but want to get this qualification or, or micro-credentials in this area. And you work around their schedules and you work around their current work. Um, the target audience will be people who are actually using additive manufacturing at the moment. So you may, I'm not sure if the, how, how how up to speed people are here in the audience, but additive manufacturing is effectively used in medical tech devices. So creating pacemakers and, and different medical devices, hip replacement joints, traditionally would have taken a piece of metal and carved it down or cut it back to suit a particular situation. This is the opposite. You start with powder and you grow the object. So it's a very disruptive, uh, innovative technology. And it's going to, it is transforming industry around the world. Some sectors are ahead of others. But the medical devices area are pretty strong, but there are other areas also that are, are catching up and see the benefits of this. So there's a lot, not only of investment in machinery and, and equipment and, and technologies in all shapes and forms, there's also a need to upskill people. So people have got to be brought on board as to how you change from the old uh, industries to this new way of manufacturing. So again, this, this, this HCI Pillar 3 project is focused on the upskilling of people uh, and their knowledge in this area and an ability to to work in this new new future uh, uh, situation so a lot of the companies we're working with are heavily involved already in the technologies some are thinking about it and they're so we're going to have a mix of people in the audience or in the in the participating in the programs and in the courses that will have 
some prior knowledge, but some will have little or, or no knowledge. So we're going to have to deal with that. And that's another agile aspect of, 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 of the program as well. So just to repeat, it's a, it's a 60 credit, the main program is 60 credits, breaks down into four 10 credit modules, micro credentials, and then a 10, 20 credit project at the end. And the project is very much based on the workplace. So it will be each individual project will be aligned to the individual student and indeed their workplace. So it, it, that is quite agile as well in terms of that ability to achieve the overall learning outcomes or the, the targets for the, for, the, for the individual modules and program, but to do so in a certain way that suits that individual participant. So there, there's just some ideas on agility uh, and relation to today's topic, but it's very exciting. It's been a bit of a hectic time in the last 12 months for everybody, I suspect, on this call and ourselves. We were slightly behind schedule in terms of getting the project up and running, but I'm glad to say now that we're very close to uh, being ready to go for September. Uh, and the plan is to have, we already have over 20 people who've expressed an interest in doing the program. We were kind of hoping we might get to 30, but we'll see where we go in September. But the, the target is to get to 32 people by September. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, we, we think we're on, we're on course for that. But we, it, the agility aspects are very much along the lines of co-creation and delivery and utilizing the research informed uh, the research capability within the organization to the teaching and their facilities as well. So there's just some, some of the aspects uh, for today's presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. Um, again, two very, very important concepts in terms of agility, the, the, the co-creating the, the curriculum as you've, you, you've set out on the additive manufacturing uh, program, um, and also uh, flexible delivery uh, again, that 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 notion that that we can't expect uh, in the in future curricula to 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 have all our students uh, free to come into to uh, full time programs running over multiple years that we have to develop the curriculum in a way that 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 suits the the the, the lifestyles and, and and needs of 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 potential uh, learners. Okay, so that was our our our, our three whistle top speakers on uh, whistle stop speakers on 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 the HCI projects. Uh, we're now going to uh, get a perspective uh, from Enterprise, another hugely uh, important perspective, the employer's perspective in all of this idea of the the uh, agile curriculum. So we uh, our speaker today is Adam Westerly. Oh, sorry, Adam, Adam Weatherly. Uh, who's the head of learning and development from the Irish SME Association? Is me. Hi, Adam. You're welcome. Um, you hi, to... hi, Jim. Yeah, well done on the surname. Tricky one. Um, <laughs> I, I have trouble with the Irish names, so you're more than welcome to have trouble with mine. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me along. It's great to be here, and it's so well attended as well, which is really good to see. Um, uh, it's uh, been a, a, a big learning curve uh, for all. Uh, business representative bodies over the last 16 months, as it has been for everyone in, in, in varying different ways, depending where you are, what sector. Um, but what was, I, I, some, some of you I know, I've said this before, so forgive me for repeating myself, but uh, 2019 for us was horrible. Um, we were in a bull economy, very busy. Um, and uh, long story short, we finished the year, I finished in the learning and development team we have very high metrics to achieve you know businesses to engage people to engage number of training days to to achieve and we were at 35 percent of target um and i was despondent um and then good old covid came along and our fortunes changed considerably um so when people when we went into the first lockdown um people came to, they engaged with us for upskilling in their droves. And it was just, it was absolutely, I was delighted to see that. And that told me one thing, it, it told me that it, it's not that SMEs won't uh, upskill, it's, it's because they can't. And this discussion today is, is, is a vital part of, you know, the, the why they couldn't engage. And it, it's because I think we lacked that agility we lacked that ease of engagement for them to take that continuous journey of learning. Um, and I, I th I, if, if COVID has got silver linings, it is, it's, it's created uh, an appetite for upskilling. Um, 
I'll run through a list of um, a short list of, of our most popular uh, topics that people engaged with us over the last 12 months. And it's quite simply, business tools were the most popular. So those were things like, you know, going from Excel beginner to intermediate and intermediate to advanced. Um, and then the, the one, you know, the other one, the Excel, which was very, very popular is, is how to do pivot tables and bar charts and how to crunch the numbers and all that sort of thing, the analysis side of things. That, that was by far the most popular. I had a natural aversion from do, for doing um, Excel for beginners um, and throwing good, good money after that sort of training, um, but I misread the appetite for it. Um, and the reason being is that you can get a perfectly good YouTube video now for free that will get you off the ground in Excel. So I, I was reluctant to throw sort of some of the, sorry, I'm losing my headphones. So some of that, you know, we, we received money from Skillnet Ireland. We run a Skillnet um, and putting sort of taxpayers money after those sort of training programs, I was reluctant to do so. But to be honest with you, the appetite is so voracious that we'll, we, we, we now do that. The other, um, the other really important programs that we ran was HR, everything HR. Uh, we ran one yesterday. Uh, it's an eight part mini series that we're doing for non HR people. And we have 16 people on there, 12 of which none of them have got an HR credential, but they wear the HR cap when they go to work. So our job is to help a non HR person make sure that they've, they've got a, a proper, properly function, functioning um, HR service to their employees, but also we provide them with tools and templates that they can populate with their own content. Um, and that was the second most popular program. Um, the other initiative that we're running is some, something we, we uh, launched last year, this time last year, which is back to business. And that encapsulates an awful lot of things. But it, it, from my perspective, from a learning perspective, um, it's about um, remodeling your business. It's about uh, providing coaching and mentoring to business owners and their staff to ensure that they get back to business when we're finally sort of uh, unleashed upon the world again, that we can, that, that they're in the best possible shape to hit the ground running uh, at, at, at good pace. Um, and we've, we've got a number of, of initiatives that encapsulate the back to business uh, strategy. I'm also involved in a number of steering groups and advisory groups, um, uh, one, one in particular being headed up by Lynn Ramsey um, uh, on the micro credentials. And I see that as a, a very important vehicle to continue this agile um, discussion. Um, and there's an advisory group that Lynn's a part of, and uh, as am I. And, and I think that's a very exciting um, uh, project uh, for Irish businesses um, and, and uh, you know, people coming out of university um, who want to um, increase their skill levels in a quick and efficient way. I think another part of it is also the affordability, and that was mentioned earlier in one of the speakers' presentations. You know, if there's money in the bank right now, they want to leave it in the bank right now, unless they see value in taking that money out and investing in their skills that's going to help them make money, to be brutally honest. If it's not going to be beneficial to the bottom line, they will not engage. Um, so um, I, I, I hope that sort of gives you, I don't want to take up too much time, but I hope that gives you an overview of what the appetite has been over the last 16 months but also um, the accelerated, um, uh, the, the accelerated reason to, to provide these agile um, uh, events and, and learning sessions, et cetera. Um, and I think that should continue. My fear is that we'll, we'll, the Irish SMEs will revert to type and we'll go back to 2019, but I'm seeing that there is a, a, a curve an upwards curve of engagement, and we've just got to keep that crest of the wave going. And that's the, that's the challenge over the next 12 months. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope I've uh, covered uh, my, my journey and, and, and Irish SME's journey over the last 16 months, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank, thank you, Jim. Thank you very much, Adam. I, I think 
make a number of very important points there. The, the, the fact that, um, you know, the, the myth around SMEs not uh, willing to, 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 to upskill, uh, but really it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a case of not being enabled to. Um, and, and I think it's, it's very interesting the, 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 the way that we have the coincidence now of so many different things coming together. The, the, the COVID crisis showing that SMEs, if, if the ease of engagement is possible, that, that they will do it um, and approve an appetite. Uh, and, and the initiatives that did start pre-COVID around the agile curriculum, maybe again being accelerated in this, in, in this context. So that's very, very helpful uh, input into today's discussion. And, and no doubt we will take up some of those points later in our panel discussion. Uh, so uh, my, my, my brief is to, to, to keep things moving. Uh, so we, I'd, I'd like to move on now to our next uh, part of the, of, of, of the program. Uh, Terry's going to take this. Um, he's going to uh, take up some of those points uh, around the, 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 the questions that have been posed both uh, in the previous uh, webinar and in, prompted in the registration as well. So Terry. Okay, so um, uh, well, today already we've heard sort of different perspectives on an agile curriculum and we heard other perspectives in our first webinar. And uh, we did ask uh, everybody who registered to if they would mind answering some questions about what, what, what in their head, what, uh, how do they define an agile curriculum? And the second thing we asked them was there are two features, two words, two features that they would associate with it. So what we've done is we've put together a little video about how you as participants, uh, the different views of an agile curriculum and um, that you uh, shared. So I'm just gonna share my screen and we'll just have a quick look at the video. Thank you, Million. And you can see that a lot of the definitions that, that you uh, submitted or you were thinking about have captured the flexibility, the responsiveness, the co-creation um, um, that, that we've talked about. So Claire, if you just wouldn't mind sharing it. And, and actually, these are the same themes that we I, that came up at the, at the end of our, if you remember in the first webinar, we had a, a Google document uh, that asked you, that asked us to look at um, the different uh, features of, of, of the Agile curriculum. 
And all of these kind of things came up. So you see iterative, dynamic, evolving, responsive, uh, talking about pivoting quickly, focused on transversal skills, innovative, and then prompting rethinking the role CI, ATI duration and front loaded programs. And I think that's capturing some of the talk about the micro credentials that, that were coming through. But when we asked the participants uh, for this webinar to, to give us uh, their, their feedback, the, some of the stuff that came back was very interesting. So I'll just give you an, a, a moment then to, uh, to have a look at some of those there. And they also, some of them we classified sort of as kind of characteristics or, or principles. So these are the kinds of things that are coming through. But I think what's what's um, what's very clear is that there's there is that that kind of consensus about what it can do. And Jacqueline, I'll be very interested to talk about afterwards about you were talking about the process of, of putting it together. And one of the questions I suppose that that I've asked there in the in the um, chat is how how can we how can what's been learned within each of these individual HCI projects? How can we as a sector share what's coming out? So that we're all learning from the experience and informing each other. So that's one question, Jim, as I hand over to you and the panel that I'd like you to tackle for us as well. Thank you, Terry. We'll certainly do that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, we'd like to invite panelists back. Um, obviously, you don't have to come up onto a stage now, but uh, from, from your living rooms or, or, or offices. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll start off by putting Terry's question to, 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 to all of you. Um, how can we share the learning that on the Agile curriculum that's coming from these uh, HCI projects? And indeed also the, the learning that we're, we're, we're getting from um, industry and enterprise and, 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 and particularly to Adam, the, the learning that he's had, how that we, we can disseminate that more widely within uh, the, the, the higher education context. Okay, so I might uh, uh, pin it on Jacqueline first as, as you started earlier. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, I mean, I certainly think it's an important aspect, Terry, and the likes of this type of thing is a first start on that process in terms of people knowing what each other's projects are about. And I suppose it is about us being willing to disseminate information and share information and as I said in my presentation, we recognize that part of the ability to be able to have this agile curriculum is having in place um, processes and processes or processes and policies that allow us to do that. And that is one of the challenges. So it's important for us to build the evidence base um, of you know, what works and what doesn't work uh, and to be able to share the practice. So I think the National Forum has an important role in that in terms of being able to share a practice. Plus, um, certainly in our project, and I'm quite sure it's the same in the other projects, built into it is in one of our work packages is, is about dissemination um, you know, across our own three institutions in the first instance, but then wider beyond that because it is important to share practice. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, Blonet, uh, do you have any pearls of wisdom to us uh, for us on this one? <laughs> No, I, I, I was going to say everything Jacqueline said, um, absolutely, um, were, were the things I was thinking and like that too, it is important for us and one of our key outcomes that we would share. And so one of the things that we have built in is that evaluation, that ongoing evaluation and that reflection and then examining ways that we can disseminate that, both because Internally, it is important for us to raise the, the profile and to establish the, the importance of doing this in a robust evidence-based kind of sound pedagogy. And, and if it meets all of those things, then 
not just um, for like this, which I completely agree, Jacqueline, are incredibly important, but also in terms of actually publishing um, and sharing, disseminating almost internationally the extent to which within Ireland we are developing and embedding systematically the different aspects that we're doing across these projects. Thanks, Blanet. Uh, before I come to Adam, I might just ask Ken for his, his view on this question of dissemination of, of the learning that we're, we're all developing on, on the Agile curriculum. Yeah, thanks, Jim. A bit like Blanet and Jacqueline, um, we're, there's an openness saying generally we're kind of excited about the project. We expect to learn an awful lot of lessons. We certainly have those internally, but I'm, I'm happy, I think that the, the project team will be quite happy to share those on a, a wider basis. I, I was, we, we, a lot of our work has been in partnership with industry. And some of those companies are competing with each other. And you always have that tension within the groups that will, who's willing to share information and, and, and publish and so on. But I think there's a general spirit of openness to learn lessons and to, 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 to share on things like co-delivery and, and, and co-creation. Uh, I think there is a willingness. And again, like Blon has said, that we will publish, we will try and share in some appropriate form, be it national or international, uh, some of the lessons we, we have from the project. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Adam, um... I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, th th this, I suppose, uh, you know, we, in, in, in an academic environment, there is that tradition of, of, of uh, networking and, 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 and sharing of learning. Uh, in terms of breaking down the barriers, the, the walls between academia and, and industry and enterprise, is there, is there anything that comes to mind to you about how, you know, a, a, a group, a, a body like ISME uh, and, and employers and representative bodies generally how they can actually uh, share their learning uh, you know with academia yeah I, um, I have a very good example actually a very a very recent and relevant one um, where we, we we work closely with um, solace um, and a couple of years ago when their skills to advance program they were trying to launch that and get it out there um, and what we did is they partnered with us and in the giddy days where we could actually travel around the country and do what we called our business roadshow um, is that we the local representatives from the ETBs came in and gave a talk on skills to advance and we supported that and just on Ken's point there about sort of you know internal competition and people attending and being in the same in the same boat there is a level of openness there and the skills to advance training uh, initiative very much competed with my own training, but I don't think that matters. I think, I think it depends on what suits the individual and the company and the sector that's important over and above the fact that you are sort of vying for a similar, similar piece of business in a similar space. Um, that's really important, but you learn more from your competitors in a collaborative environment and a work group than you will from someone who's in a completely different sector altogether. So um, I, I think my, I would encourage to engage with me. I would encourage to engage with chambers, uh, the Small Firms Association, IBEC, uh, of which SFA are part of, of course, um, because they have, we have, uh, uh, big business networks that we can promote these types of ad agile programs, et cetera, um, out to the marketplace. Thank you very much, Adam. So the, the offer is there, everyone. <laughs> um, I, I, I have an interesting uh, question that's come from the, uh, the, 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 the floor. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a really interesting one. And it, tough one to answer but i'm going to to give it to the panel anyway uh because i'm a tough guy uh do, do the speakers have a view on the length of the agility life cycle and and what's meant by this is you know how long before today's agile responses in turn have to be replaced by a newer agile response um in, in other words can we keep up with agility in in, in effect um so Jacqueline, I, I, again, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly it's a, it's a very good question. And, um, you know, it, that's what that shows the importance of this type of funding and these types of projects is in order to enable us to be able to be innovative and keep up to date because things change all of the time and so rapidly, especially in the area of, of digital technology and, and systems and so on. 
So we've got um, national, you know, as a country and as a sector to make sure that we stay on top of this, you know, in, in order to be able to meet the needs of, of our students and our and the employers that we're seeking to serve. So we, we have just got to have that kind of mindset and ethos within our organizations. And, you know, we're certainly very grateful um, within the CEUA to have received this fund in, in order to allow us to be able to um, extend our capacity to be agile and innovative, but it's got to be within the mindset of the organization and uh, the organizations and just as, uh, you know, a general approach um, in order to make sure that we're providing to meet the needs of our students and also that we're able to compete um you know internationally um within this particular sector so it's it's very important but it just has to be a constant mindset of always looking out for new innovations now not just to jump on the bandwagon of something just because it's trendy or whatever you know it has to be done in a in a you know in a sensible way but it's it's certainly important to have that um within the ethos of the organization and to um you know, resource it in order to be able to happen. Yeah, I, 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 thank you, Jacqueline. Um, I, I, in posing this question to Blonde, I'm just going to maybe add a little bit to it. I mean, and, and it goes back to something that um, Adam was talking about earlier. I mean, ha, have we, with the COVID experience, you know, are, are, are we jumping through a more substantial agility phase now? Or, or and, and, and is this the big crossing of the Rubicon or not, as the case may be? And, but if it is, then is it going to be more, you know, smaller, more ongoing incremental change thereafter? I mean, these are big questions, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask it. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that absolutely, and, and my, my colleague, Kieran Dunn, we, we've had multiple conversations around this, that change was afoot. And, and in a, we would feel strongly that, that COVID has accelerated that. So it, it's not been the, the, the initiator of it, but certainly it's accelerated the rate of change that we're experiencing at the moment now, absolutely. And we do need to, and, and I know a colleague mentioned it before, we need to make sure we don't go back to 2019 in every way and that we do take the learnings from the last year and a half, good and bad, and build and continue to, to develop on those. So I do think in many ways, I hope we have crossed the Rubicon, that we don't just now that everything it looks like there's an end in sight, that we don't discount the last two years and all the changes we, we've gotten from the COVID induced restrictions um, that, that we build and learn from them. Because certainly in DCU, and I, I'm sure every institution is the same, some things have worked better than we'd have expected. And there are positives that have come from some of the, the approaches that we have taken to where we have had to change how we would have done things prior to it. Um, and I think to, in terms of agility, one of the things that we've got to do, and, and Jacqueline mentioned this in terms of talking around that mindset change. I think the mindset change that's been catalyzed, certainly in DCU and I think in other institutions too, is around an openness to, to consider things that you wouldn't have previously considered. And so I think capturing and developing and, and ensuring we don't lose that mindset whilst coupling it with an evaluation of and that reflection of what has worked and what hasn't worked um, with the, the, the third piece, as Jacqueline again said, the resourcing to be able to act on those reflections um, can mean that while the life cycle to the question, I don't know, and it's one of the things that we will learn through things like HCI, um, certainly the concept of us having to evaluate and build and develop on that is something that hopefully COVID has accelerated to an extent that allows us to do really exciting things in the next few years. Thanks, Blonnet. Ken, I was, I was wondering, do you have a perspective on this? Um, you know, the agility life cycle, the big bang and... <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I think we're all still grappling with the lessons from COVID, and I think it'll take a while for them to be absorbed across the sector. But as Blonde said, there's, there has been positive developments, and we should hang on to the, uh, the, those developments as we go forward. But in terms of life cycle, the HCI Pillar 3 is 2020 to 2024. So that's a life cycle in a sense. Within that, then, we've got annual reviews. So there's many life cycles, and we'll go back and change things. But who knows the future? None of us on this call knows what's going to happen. I think we've got to be more agile in the future to deal with whatever comes at us. If we don't have students, that's the end of the life cycle for a particular program. But I, I think there's lots of students out there from 17 to 70. 
uh, who need lifelong learning skills and knowledge and lots of different uh, te uh, technologies. And, and again, their work-life balance has changed hugely in the last year. And I'm very conscious of that community that are out there that have reflected on where they are in their own lives and where they want to go in the future. And I'm not so sure they've figured all that out either. So in terms of us dealing with that lifelong learning community, Jim, I think it's going to be a while before, before we observe, observe, um, absorb all the, all the lessons. Uh, but I, I think agility is just going to be part of the norm for us in the future, to be honest. And that's just that's just the reality. Thank you. Many thanks, Ken. Adam, um, the, you in some ways stimulate this question earlier. Do, do you have anything further to, 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 to say on it, you know, about do, the fact that... Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours. Um, well, well, firstly, I think Ireland should be very pleased with, with itself um, in the way it responded to the crisis. Um, and it proved that we had extremely robust frameworks and models in place already. Uh, the other thing is uh, just, just imagine that, you know, something that Ken just mentioned, the HCI is 2020 to 2024. Well, just imagine if it was 2022 to 2026, we wouldn't have had the HCI in place. <coughs> Uh, uh, on the outs, uh, uh, the the outset of uh, COVID, you know, and thank goodness it was in place because and and it was already sort of embedded into our in, in into our models, our frameworks. Um, but I I think it it proved that Ireland has got these robust models in place to be able to respond quickly. So I think that's a big tick in the box. Um, you know, we, we have uh, SkillNet Ireland is, uh, I, to, to me, I, I work with colleagues around Europe who have the same role that I do. Um, and they are very envious of the SkillNet model, the way that funds are distributed amongst these training networks, whether they're sec sectoral networks or whether they're regional or national as, as my, my remit is, which is another challenge I have. But anyway, that's another story. For another day, but um, um, I, I think you know we, we also have a very well stocked national training fund, which, uh, as I mentioned, I, I'm on the national training fund advisory group, but I mentioned in the meeting on Monday that it was strategically plundered to address these uh, uh, problems that we have. So we're very fortunate to have that levy on business to to build such a robust national training fund that that is. I hate the word surplus, but it is in surplus. So, you know, we, we, we have that cushion. But I think um, uh, st strategically, Ireland, uh, sort of in the lead up to the HCI in 2018 and 2019, that was very much well ahead of the game across, I, I would say, against our EU neighbours. So I think, we, I think we could be very proud of what we got. Um, but you're right, as, as we move into, into 2022, you know, it's a little bit of a crystal ball. What's going to happen? We don't really know, but we can, if we carry on doing this sort of work, I still, I think we'll be in very good, uh, uh, a very good state of health. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, I think that's, it's, it's 1329 now. So I think that may be a, a, a good optimistic note to, 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 to end the panel discussion. I, we obviously with webinars, we have to keep the, to the, the, the time slots, uh, fairly tight, uh, but uh, here's to strategic plundering, anyway. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to uh, pass over to Claire in the forum now, who's just going to uh, lead us out of the, the, the webinar with some points. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, everyone. It's a, a lot of food for thought in the discussion there. Um, and I suppose we began with a, a key question um, for both webinars and at the start of this series, which was whether people think it is important to have a national understanding of agile curriculum to support the current developments, particularly under the HCI projects and around the likes of micro credentials, which we've discussed today. And, you know, that question, again, was something we put to people in the registration process for today. And out of the 32 answers received, there is an overwhelming majority saying yes. And I think that you wouldn't be surprised to hear that, having heard the very rich uh, discussion and the contributions of all our speakers today and in the first webinar. Um, but with some nice comments here, and again, illuminating this a little bit further, it needs to be supported nationally to interpret and implement agility properly. There were some really interesting questions in the chat there just now about what agility means and in response to what, how we work together towards the common 
common goals and share the best practice and innovation. Terry has raised the issue in the chat of whether we need a network for this, which could be something we pursue further. Engagement at European and national level, including all of our stakeholders, a methodological approach to ensure that the key aspects are met and a national understanding as long as that's um, not going to drain energy or at local level agility uh, around this issue. So there's so much for us to, to work with there. And in terms of our next steps uh, within the forum, the conversation, first of all, will be taken forward through the development of a new National Forum Insight publication, which will follow later in 2021. But we do want to continue this, and conversation is the word used intentionally here. Um, if you'd like to be involved in that continuing conversation, please get in touch and my email address is there as the point of contact in the first instance for this and something we'll pick up and develop on further uh, going into the next academic year. Just then to mention the final seminar in this particular series, which is after the summer break on the 6th of October, Transforming Teaching and Learning for Student Success. So we highlight that and ask you to save the date for that one. And now I'm going to hand to Terry just for a word of thanks in terms of today. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, Jim, many thanks uh, for for chairing for the this the, the second of the webinars. We do, we really do appreciate it. Uh, to Jacqueline, to Blana, to Ken, and to Adam, thank you very much for speaking. To all of you as participants, I know it's the end of June, and I know everybody's tired. So I really appreciate uh, the time that you've you've taken to join us today. The conversation isn't finished. The forum will be um, continuing our work around the agile curriculum. And uh, I would encourage anybody who'd like to be involved in those conversations with it to, to contact Claire. Thank you very much again, everybody. Bye-bye just now. Bye everyone, thank you.